Welcome to Tech Tactics Live. We're gonna record another seminar for those that aren't here. We're in Pocono, Pennsylvania at the 66th Porsche Parade. I'm here with Jim Erlbeck, Chesapeake Region member. He's gonna be talking about welding today. Now I have zero experience in welding. It's probably a good thing you don't hand me one of those. Uh, but I've always been interested in the different types. I go to various shops, I see people working on cars, and I'm always um, just, I'm intimidated, to be honest with you, about working with welding materials. And, you know, I think Porsches and or even older cars, you might see it as being easy in the terms of you just kind of connect one ground and then you kind of hold a little stick or maybe there's a feeder. But today's cars are also much more complicated than that. And then managing heat, mean, managing the electronics, you titled this Welding is Easy. And I don't know how that's going to go because uh, you're teaching someone like me <laughs> uh, but i'm going to throw it over to you and okay. everyone welcome to uh porsche parade and let's welcome jim Elbeck. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and that was a great intro actually because all those topics you mentioned i'm going to cover perfect so so we're, so we're there. like we planned it uh and, and and welding is easy as you can see can you read the next line if you know easy. what to do and, and how, how to, how to do, do it, it. And if you can read it, maybe I should have actually made a little smaller font because that's what people don't tell you. Um, welding to me is, is kind of like driving a car on the track. The theory is really easy if you break it down. And you break it down to three things. And you're going to hear a lot of threes from me, by the way, so I'm going to give you a warning on this. But uh, it, if you think about driving a car on track, it, it's accelerate, brake, apex, repeat as needed. Okay, by the afternoon, you should be setting lap times, right? I mean, how simple is that? I mean, what else is there? Of course, we all know that's not it. Welding looks really easy until you get into it, and then all of a sudden, it gets overwhelming. So I'm gonna demystify that, help you understand what it is, how to self-teach, because this is a 50-minute session, as far as I'm concerned, on brain surgery. Now, that's a good thing, if you're going through a divorce and the brain surgery is gonna be on your spouse, okay? Maybe not a good thing. You might wanna take the second and third follow-up class if you actually like your spouse, okay? So we're gonna break this down, go through it. Um, as I said, there's gonna be a lot of threes here because the way my, my mind works is if it's a really huge topic, if I can get it into three smaller buckets, I can get my arms around it. Other than that, I get into what I call analysis paralysis and I never get started. So, um, this is not a class on Dale Earnhardt. We're not talking about him, he drove the wrong car. This is about welding. So, the three things that we're gonna cover today are how, about, how to buy a machine, how to make a weld, and that has its own little three set. That three set, and I'm gonna repeat this many times, this stuff is important, I'm gonna keep going over. So, it'll get, you're gonna get it. It's metallurgy, process, and technique. You've gotta have those three things there, okay? so. I'm gonna teach you how to buy a machine, how to make a weld, how to spot a bad weld, and what to do about that, all right? So why should you stay here? Because I'm gonna consume 50 minutes of your life. So if you wanna get up and walk out, you're not gonna hurt my feelings, but I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna cover and why it's important to you. So it's important to you if you're really curious as to what goes into a modern car. I'm gonna cover all the, just like you said, how do we hold this stuff together? What's in that car right there, you know? We know the nuts and bolts, not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, welding, brazing, soldering, and how to spot a weld. So if you're looking at buying a used car, is that a factory weld? Or is this thing possibly hit? And hit much harder, because the paint meter will tell you that the paint's been redone, but it won't tell you the why or how deep it goes. And we're gonna have photographs, you know, of cars I've looked at that don't have factory welds on. So you will spot that stuff. So, uh, and by the way, because this is brain surgery and I don't want to just kind of ramble off, and I'm a big fan on this quote. It's been attributed to a lot of different people. Sorry for the length of this letter. It would have been shorter had I had more time. Mm -hmm. And you got to think about that. So to pack all the stuff in 50 minutes, I need a roadmap, so forgive me. So at any rate, um, so stick around if you're curious how, the, how a Porsche is made, if you're looking uh, at restoring or buying a used car. Um, I've been in your seats before. Again, you've got 50 minutes you're gonna give to me. Thank you for doing that. So who am I? 
So I'll, I'll give you a little background on, on myself. Uh, mechanical engineer, postgraduate work in material science. I've worked all my life as a welding engineer. Been very fortunate. I've been able to create and build a company that sells welding equipment, cutting machines. We manufacture, distribute, compress um, cryogenic gases, the bottles. Uh, we've got six welding schools right now. We process probably about 750 students per year. We do failure analysis on the welds for major companies. Every Harley that's been produced in the 10 years because of the proximity to our headquarters in Baltimore to the York, Pennsylvania plant for Harley, every Harley that's been made in the past 10 years has come through our mechanical engineering lab where we've sliced and diced the welds, looked at it, given a report, and their engineers go, this meets our requirements, or they go back and try it again, give us another one to slice and dice. So we are kind of their goalkeeper, and we do that for other companies as well. Uh, I'm a Porsche uh, owner. Uh, I bought my first Porsche in 1977. I grew up on a drag strip with my brother in the 60s and 70s. But when I bought that first Porsche, I realized that I had more fun going around the turns than I had going in straight lines. So, um, and by the way, I, it, you're not going to see the name of my company here. It's intentional. You know who I am. Because when I'm sitting in your seat, I'm always like, what's this guy trying to sell me in here? Yeah. My point is, I'm not trying to sell you anything. And if you're going to buy a machine, buy local. Find the guy that has the knowledge that can help you out. We all know that that oracle of all knowledge, the internet, has got the answer. But the trouble is, that answer is buried in so much nonsense. And you don't have the technical expertise to ferret out what the right answer is. So, and I'm going to help you learn that. So anyhow, so um, next slide, if you would, please, Robert. What does hold a modern car together? If I was presenting to the Subaru people, they would probably say something like this, because you've noticed their advertising campaign. No offense to Subaru. No, no offense. It's just a factual statement. Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to. But, but, but we're Porsche people, and, and we don't say things like this. We say things like, kills bugs fast. That's how <laughs> we think. Okay. So uh, what is in a 992? Next slide. Oh, a bunch of buzzwords. Okay. I hate buzzwords, by the way. I always think buzzwords are created so you can quickly spot who's in your tribe and who's out of your tribe. Okay. You will know these buzzwords by the time we get done. So you can at least fake it. So there's 3.5 meters of mag welding, 17 meters of MIG welding, 116 friction stir welding. You, most of you who have welding machines have no clue what a friction stir is. Really cool process. 813 resistance welds. Most people just call those spot welds. 188 meters of adhesive bonding. Are you talking about Subaru now or Porsche? No, this is, well, actually, th this, is, this is pretty much true for all modern cars. But this is, this is what goes into a 992. Wow. Okay, and this is a this is a Porsche uh, set set of data points that they presented at a Tech Tactics mm -hmm. at Easton. Okay, so if I remember correctly, so but it's fairly representative of every car. Um, 1944 semi tubular rivets. Ooh, okay, so pop rivets. You, you've seen it. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, no significant amount of TIG or laser. But I'm going to talk about laser because if you're on the internet and you're researching welding, you're going to read more and more about laser welders. And we are selling them right now. They are not for your home, mm. but they are handheld. They are sexy as can be. They're yeah. handheld? Yeah, the handheld laser. You've got to think about this. I've mm. got a laser in my hand, and I've got enough energy to melt that metal and make a weld. And I've got samples here. And you'll see it, and you go, whoa, I can't do that with anything else. Mm. So a really cool process. But at 30 grand a pop all in. Oh, yeah. yeah that's what I was like, what part of the handheld? That sounds like something you could use at the yeah. home, but it's the price tag. It's the price tag. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see more laser welding in the automotive manufacturing. So you're going to see it on the shop floor, mm -hmm. okay, at, at Porsche. Um, there is some soldering. And I'm not talking about the electrical soldering that goes on. If you were paying attention the way welding engineers do for when they pop up slides like this or on Andy makes an announcement as to what the new GT3 is. They said that the GT3 exhaust is soldered rather than welded to save weight. 
Is that the old school method where you have like the feed stick and exactly. letting it in? Exactly. Oh. So now soldering can be open flame, that's your heat source. It could be an induction like your cooktop. Mm. Uh, could be a furnace. Don't know how they do it, but mm. they solder it. And of course, I'm kind of a skeptical engineer. You can type so, it's like, that saved weight, really? Um, because there are welding processes that add no weight. But modern engineering design of cars and everything else, we're changing materials, we're experimenting with things, just like this adhesive bonding. You know, how do I feel about that? Mm. I know if that was 188 meters of welds, they'd be good for the next 50 years. Adhesive bond, could be. Then again, anybody here have a 996 or 997 turbo with water tubes that have needed to be, you're familiar with this, okay? So they glued the water tubes into the aluminum casting. They're now failing. So if you're gonna trap- You're talking about the coolant tubes. Coolant tubes, so- That hit very close to home. I, you should apologize to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if they were welded, we wouldn't be when having you get this discussion. That, when you get that sweet smell coming off the top of your engine. It, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and I believe that, that if you're going to track that car, they're now saying if it's not either pinned or welded, you can't track your car. Because when they fail on the track, they fail catastrophically, spilling antifreeze, which is not real good for the guy that's behind, behind you. Behind you, yeah. So... Um, GT3s. GT3s. GT3s, yeah, exactly. Um, so I do know, had Porsche not in their infinite wisdom, and again, I'm not throwing rocks at them, you know, they need to keep costs down. They're experimenting with new techniques, so it's what they should be doing. And there's thousands of parts. Exactly. Yeah. Um, had they welded them, we wouldn't have this problem. And the repair process is pull them out. And again, that oracle of things, if you go to research that, a lot of people say, you can't weld them. They've been contaminated by the coolant. Nonsense. Total nonsense. A weld's a great way to do it. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, um, so things are changing. So let's, let's get into um, terms and definitions. Because I am talking about mag welding. So thank you for doing that, Robert. Uh, who sets the terms and definitions? Because you're not looking in your Webster dictionary trying to figure this stuff out. So the, the organization that sets the terms and definitions for welding geeks like me to use is the American Welding Society out of Miami, Florida. The second organization uh, that I want to talk about is ASM, American Society of Metals. So pretty much if you're looking for information and it's been published, put out there by AWS or ASM, it's golden. You don't have to look any further. And if you say, Jim, all right, I want to learn more about this. Is there a book? Where do I go? My Bible, the best book. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are like me. You've got a wall full of Porsche books that you've read, manuals. Okay? I'm that way with welding stuff. And if, if you said, well, what's your favorite book? Every other book goes away. What book would you keep? It's this one. And it's this edition, which is why I brought it in. Um, this edition was kind of pre-attorneys. Uh, so, and I can say that because my No wife, offense to attorneys that no, are watching. No, 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 why no. are you making me have? <laughs> I like to see you sweat. Um, and you can pass that around if you want to, but what's magical about that, the reason I say it's pre-attorneys is ASM actually, several decades ago, got sued by some people because they said, we followed what you said in one of your examples, and it didn't turn out right. So therefore, you're liable. So then they kind of neutered the books. Now they've gone back to it again. But if you get this old, old guy right here, it's golden because it's got wonderful charts in it, like on the topic of aluminum. Aluminum is very, very difficult. It's got a chart that says if you're welding this alloy to that alloy, oh, ease of welding is this ferro metal, strength of weld is this ferro metal, uh, corrosion resistance is this ferro metal. So you pick what you want because in the engineering world there's a term called fit for service. So it's not that a weld's good and a weld's bad necessarily. Which one's fit for service? Which one has the attributes that you're looking for? And on that point, a uh, little, little, little side note, um, I was involved with a project for Dana where they said we are welding the frame rails of an F-150. We're a tier one almost supplier. 
And we want to put these guys together with a welding speed uh, that's better than what we normally get with MIG. MIG welding normally welds at about 20 inches a minute. Okay, so great. How do you want to go? You want to go 30, 40? Oh, no, our goals are much loftier. Oh, 100? No, more like 400. Think you can get us 400? We did. To my eye, it looked horrible, but it was fit for service in the fact it kind of melted everything together. So structurally, it was sound. It's just not something you'd look at and go, that's a damn good looking weld there. I want to do that. It's not that. So anyhow, um, so uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's define a couple things. I said that the exhaust on a GT3 was soldered. Soldering is defined as less than 450 degrees Celsius. It's just a line in the sand bill. It's, it's not, there's a little bit of science behind it, but they had to make a call, mm -hmm. okay? Welding um, is when you get the base metal, the pieces you're joining, and the filler metal, the wire that's going in, liquid at the same time. Solder, like you said, the filler metal is, is liquid, but the base metal is solid. Mm. And you go, oh well, golly, um, I know something about steel. Steel normally melts at about 2,400 degrees. You've got 24 there, and you've got 450 Celsius, which is about 780 Fahrenheit. What's in between? Brazing. Mm. Okay, so soldering, brazing, welding. Um, another term I want to make sure you understand, because some of you will say, I do need to get my coolant tubes welded. I'm not going to do it myself. How do I know that Rob is better at this than Rachel? Well, the question you want to ask him is, are you a certified welder? And that's really a street term. I'm not going to try and tell you what the real term is because everyone just, use, it's like Kleenex. If I ask you for, you know exactly what I want. So do we have to get into the fact that it's a Kimberly Clark product? Or, no, we don't. So if I'm trying to figure out who's the better person to do my job, Rachel, are you a certified welder? Yes. Are you a certified welder? Yes. Well, great. I know they're better than Vu, who's not certified. Okay. You don't know that. <laughs> You'd be and, correct. You'd be correct. But, but actually, actually, you're a good dance partner. And stuff. Uh, he may be a better welder than these two. Okay. Uh, a welder certification is kind of like an FCCA competition license or a driver's license. It just means that you've had some training, you passed a test, and on that day you had the skills to get over that test. It doesn't mean you're any good at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. But generally it does, okay? Would you rather have someone drive your new Porsche who doesn't have a driver's license or who does? Well, of course, who does? So I'd rather have these two than you, no offense, because you may be better. Uh, but now I gotta figure out which one. So they both said they're certified welding. Okay, that's it. No, Rachel, what are you certified in? Well, I'm certified to do stick welding on half inch plate and up. Well, wait a minute, I'm welding an aluminum water tube. That's got nothing to do with that. Rob, oh, I'm an aerospace qualified aluminum TIG welder. Oh, he's my guy. So you want to ask, first question, are you certified? You don't need to get into by whom, to what code necessarily, but what's your certification good for? And every certification is out there is um, nailing down materials, meaning is it steel, is it aluminum, is it titanium? So it's alloy specific. It is thickness specific because welding two inch thick steel is a lot different from welding sheet metal on that car. Mm. So it's, it's very similar to like finding a certified Porsche mechanic and wanting to make sure that they know 356s if you're working on a 356 or they're, they know 993s. That, that's it exactly, yeah. it, exactly. Do, do I want to take my, my 991 to a guy that only knows 356s or vice versa? No. Right. So, but they're both Porsche mechanics. So you gotta drill that a little bit deeper. And when, then once you do that, that's fine. You don't, I don't think you need to ask them to show you their cert because if they give it to you, you won't know how to read it anyhow. Just like that book you just handed to just me. Just like that. No, actually that book is very readable if you took the time. And that's what I like about that. It is. I even, went through a couple of pages and it was e Greek. E e even you, even you. <laughs> and besides, you know a welding geek and you can call me, so, so we're good. So, you really want to make sure that, that you know who's doing that repair for you. Beyond that, um, let, let's go in, into the welding processes that are used in, in cars, old and new. 
I was talking to one gentleman. Oh, it was, it was Frank, uh, this, this good-looking guy with the gray hair and the blue shirt. Uh, he said, yeah, my, my dad taught me how to use this thing. It's got the tanks and the flame. Okay, that's oxyacetylene welding. Tank of oxygen, tank of acetylene gas. Has to be acetylene, can't be propane because of some chemical um, things that happen within the flame itself. So those two things create a flame. That flame is about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you want to measure it within the code. Again, I said steel melts at about 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's enough heat to melt the steel, isn't it? I'm mm -hmm. in. Can I use that process on aluminum? Because aluminum melts at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. The answer is no. There I use oxygen and hydrogen, a very forgotten skill but it's a good process. So that's the oxy fuel welding. Resistance welding, and you remember I said there's 813 resistance welds in a 992. That's what most people call um, spot welding, and it's, it's two arms, I, I put in two plates, and I've got two tongs, and, and you've all seen these in the movies, okay? Oh, they kind of pinch it. Yeah, pardon? They and they pinch it, pinch exactly, it, yeah. they, they pinch it. And, and it pinches it, puts a little force to it, then passes some current through it, which, because it's in perfect contact, resistive heating heats up that steel and then forces more pressure to shove it together, okay? Mm -hmm. To forge it together. And depending on the alloy, maybe an extra surge of, of energy just to make sure it's all stuck together, okay? Very simple, very, very easy to apply process, and that's why the automotive world loves it. Lots of spot welds going way back when. As soon as they invented that process, the automotive community immediately embraced it. So look at your 356, lots of spot welds in, okay? As well as some oxy fuel welds and leading, mm -hmm. okay? But leading's really not a welding process. It's, it, solder typically is tin and lead. That's what, when you buy a roll of solder from Home Depot where you get that stuff, and you, mm -hmm. that's what that is. So the leading process on cars, which is really a body technique, not a joining technique, um, it's solder, mm -hmm. really is. So oxy fuel, resistance welding. Um, then we get, and again, I, I wanted to talk about laser beam because there's so much buzz on the internet. We get a lot of calls about, want to buy a laser welder? No, you don't. I'll sell you one, I'll take your money, don't get me wrong. But uh, at 30 grand a pop, it makes no sense. And the process moves at about five feet a minute. So floor to, you know, here in one minute. That's Generally, how quickly you can put and start the weld at the bottom? Yeah, and come up here to there to that height. in one minute, and I'm done. Wow. Now, if I'm welding a very intricate part, that's way too fast. I can't control that as, mm -hmm. as a person. As a, if I was a robot, I could. Okay, So that's what I'm saying. You're going to see this in the future manufacturing of your, of your Porsches. Uh, I do have a sample of a laser weld. Right here. Yep. Let's, uh, let, I, I want to, I want to pass, I'll pass this around to you and actually where is, oh, I'll put that down so you can, you can put the evil eye on that. So laser weld versus traditional TIG weld. So it's much narrower of a point. Exactly. Because what I'm dealing with and from a welding engineering standpoint, I love high energy density processes. I want something that packs a lot of punch in a very small spot. Lasers, that's, that's it. That's what they do. Where a torch, if you think about it, it's a lot of heat just kind of floating around and it's not really focused. That's why that process is so slow. So uh, is, is the ultimate temperature at the laser weld much higher, much lower, the um, same? But just for a split second. Just for a split yeah, second. Split second, w which is good. We all, we all know that if we don't heat metal up, it doesn't distort. It's just lays there, okay? And as we heat it up, that's when it turns into a potato chip. You probably don't want your fender on your Carrera looking like a potato chip. Mm. So you don't want a process that dumps in a whole lot of heat. You want something that gets in, gets the job done, gets it out of there. Does the later laser weld have an element that material that you're adding or is it just melting the two existing pieces together? You're really good at this. Um, the answer is yes, both ways. Now this particular weld has had metal added to it. All right. Mm. I have an example of a piece of stainless steel that was not 
Oh, so that, that used the existing material and joint. Exactly. All it's doing is heating the two pieces up and letting them flow together. Um, if you really want to impress your friends when you go home and you say, I listen to this guy about welding, I'm a welding engineer now, I know all about autogenous welds. That's one. Okay? Autogenous, autogenous welds. Autogenous. Say it with me, kids. Autogenous, autogenous okay. welds. Okay. And it's spelled like autogenous, A-U-T-O-G-E-N-O-U-S, autogenous. Um, it just means we didn't put any filament in. Mm. Okay. Um, That's a so, very clean weld. Isn't it? Isn't it? I told you. And no, doesn't deform the existing material. No, everything's just straight and narrow because, again, I'm just trucking along at five feet a minute. I'm, I'm melting. It's solidifying. It just boom, done. And so, no why distortion. why is it thirty thousand dollars? Like, is it the contraption that creates the laser beam that expensive? We, we have we have patent rights to pay back to Star Wars. Ah, so, gotcha. So Hollywood, they get, they get <laughs> no. It's it's just the tech. It, you're paying for the R and D work. Um, ah. and, and you can find these systems cheaper on the internet. You know, you can find some systems out of the uh, Pacific Rim, but the company that's my company of choice, we're all in with training machine set up and there's safety consider a lot of safety consideration because this is a divergent laser beam rather than a convergent laser beam so if i had one right now i could put donna's eyes out from this distance don't want to do that to donna she's really way to auto single her out <laughs> yeah i know well she was starting to yeah she was falling asleep and she beats me at autocross so i'm going to take her out right now uh, so that's why I'm saying it's 30. But you could probably find a laser beam welder on the internet for 12 or 15. Okay? Thousand. The, the, the company, thousand. Okay. Exactly. The company that we're dancing with um, is based and produces the equipment in Boston. Okay. Anytime I can buy US, I will. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's laser. Uh, now, in. Then we get into friction stir welding, and I told you there are 116 friction stir welds in a 992. Really cool process. You will definitely not have this in your garage because mm. it's not 30,000. It's not 300,000. Piece of machinery is a million plus, probably several million, because it uses no heat. It uses no electricity to generate that puddle. Mm. You put two plates together. Let's make the plates Play-Doh. Okay, something gooey. Steel's not gooey, but um, just mentally, it's gooey. Put these two pieces of Play-Doh together, and then I take a stirring paddle and I do this, and I, and I get them to go together. Then I have one piece of Play-Doh. This machine does that with steel and does it with aluminum. So it's not an arc, it's not a flame. It's controlled friction. Is, it's moving this almost like a ball end mill, for those of you who are machines uh, around and applying pressure at the same time and not letting it squish out. I was going to say, and, and not letting it distort the exactly. existing material. Exactly, and that's the trick. There's no distortion. So I don't know where they're using them, okay? Uh, but probably on critical parts that can have no distortion and probably aluminum mm. is, is where the application is. Uh, and you'll use it. Have you ever noticed when you get on board your, your aircraft to fly home? that the outer skin's not welded, it's riveted. Mm -hmm. Ever go, why? Why are we still riveting things? There are some aluminum alloys that are not readily weldable. Mm. But they're still, I still want to use them as an engineer because they've got better strength than the alloys that are weldable. So, great, if I've chosen one of these high strength aluminum alloys as Porsche, and I want to put it together, how do I do it? Friction stir. Good process. Hmm. Uh, remember the space shuttle? Okay, there was external tanks on the side which held liquid oxygen. At first they were plasma welded, then they were friction stir welded towards the end. That's really where this technology came from. So, uh, so really cool process. Again, probably not in your garage anytime soon. Not my garage. It's okay, it's okay. Um, so now we're getting a little closer to home. Um, there is shield of metal arc welding, which is also called stick welding. The electrode kind of looks like a Fourth of July sparkler. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I've got an, I've got a cable that go, comes from the machine. I clamp it up in it. My piece I'm welding is my ground side of my circuit, and I strike it and I consume it. People used to weld cars with that. Still can. Not on my car, you're not, and not in my garage, because it's smoky. 
it's spattery. It, it mm. kind of like a kind of like a, a going sparkler. Back to my sparkler. Yeah. yeah, it's throwing off these balls of metal that are sticking to everything. Maybe my upholstery. Maybe to this body work. You know, um, and the bead looks like poop. Quite frankly, I mean, there's just no way to really make this a good-looking bead, nice and flat. So, um, I'd let you use that process to make my trailer. Okay, I'd let you use that process to fix my John Deere, you know, tractor. Is it but a faster and inexpensive process? It's inexpensive. Inexpensive. That's, it. That's okay. why it's still around. And that process has the ability to really be tolerant of dirt, mud, middle scale. So if you are fixing my John Deere tractor, you don't have to sand it down, shot blast it, clean it up. That process just cuts through that junk, and we're good. Okay. So will you find shield metal arc stick welding at a Porsche plant, at a GM plant, and the maintenance crew to fix the line equipment, but not in your car you want? Mm. Used to. Mm. You know, go back 50 years ago. Um, so now we're getting real close to the bone. So now we get into gas metal arc welding. And if you, can you pull that slide back up, Robert, that had the processes? And then I keep going back. If you would, please. Or I was listing, there we go. So, um, mag and MIG welding are sub disciplines of what AWS calls gas metal arc welding. Okay? MAG stands for metal active gas. MIG stands for metal inert gas. They both come out of a gun that looks like this. Okay? Now this is really a hunk and war club. Okay? You're not going to buy this for your garage. This, this is a 400 ampere gun. It's kind of like you wouldn't buy a one pound mall to make picture frames. Mm. You wouldn't use this on your car. It's just too big and bulky. Um, I'll, I'll pass this around. Feel free to take the front end apart. There'll be some slides. And then you can go, oh, okay, I kind of see the stuff that goes in it. Um, this process has been around commercially since the, uh, the, the 60s. I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. you have that. Don't break it. Um, so, um, mag welding is really a European term. We don't use it too much here. And we don't use gas metal arc because it just doesn't roll off the tongue like MIG welding. So everyone comes, I want to buy a MIG welder. Okay? I, don't, I don't say, do you want metal active gas or you want metal inert gas? Don't ask that question because same, that same gun will run either one. Now, where do we use metal active gas? So if they're saying there, there are 3.5 meters of metal active gas, uh, metal active gas would be argon CO2 mixtures, maybe pure CO2, something that reacts, all right? So that would be steel. Um, metal inert gas, that's argon, pure argon, which is one of the seven noble gases. Doesn't react with anything. As a matter of fact, had you bought a 52, 356, put it in a bubble with, with, filled with argon, all that corrosion that, that John was talking about this morning, all the dry rot in your tire, wouldn't happen. Our enemy in life, <coughs> also what gives us life, is oxygen. But rust wouldn't be created if there wasn't oxygen there as well, because rust is ferric oxide. So get rid of the oxygen, replace it with argon, no, no rusting ever occurs. Okay? So when you see metal inert gas, it means they're welding aluminum. Well, that's kind of cool. There's more welding of aluminum than there is of carbon steel, which is telling you the content in your 992 has shifted to aluminum and away from all the steel in the 356. Mm. Okay? Um, but same process. Now, what's that process look like? I'm passing a torch around. Hopefully, this will kind of get you educated. I've got a nozzle which supplies a gas. Again, could be an active gas argon CO2 mixture, or it could be an inert gas, pure argon, pure helium. And its purpose is to put a cloud of that gas and push out the atmosphere. Because what's in the atmosphere, what's in your lungs right now, is about 78% nitrogen, 18% oxygen. I don't want the oxygen touching my liquid puddle. That's going to damage it metallurgically. So this gas just gets all that out of there and puts the cloud of gas there that I want. So that's its sole purpose. <clears throat> There's a contact tube that the wire that, that actually creates the arc and fills the joint, okay? It arrives to this tube, and at that contact tube, that's where it picks up electricity. That's where it becomes electrically hot, all right? Comes out continuously. This piece is a negative ground. 
or it could be positive depending on the process. Um, an arc is struck as that wire touches there, okay? And this is important as we get into how to buy a machine. That wire actually touches and then it has to burn back and create an arc, a stable arc. That takes some pretty fancy electronics to make that happen. You don't get those fancy electronics in a cheap machine. We're going to talk about that. Um, and then the arc's got to be stable, so this ball that's being transferred doesn't fly off this way and that way and make ugly mess. So that's MIG welding. Then there is TIG welding, gas tungsten arc. Can I? There we go. So this is a little different. Now we're doing a two-handed process. Now you really got to think about this. That one, you just pick the gun up, you squeeze the trigger, that energizes the machine, it feeds the wire out, sparks happen, you make a weld. And so just your run of bead is what makes it steady and it's yeah. one hand. Yeah, and as long as you've got a nice steady pace and you keep the distance from that contact tip to the work where it should be, life is good. That's the technique. Remember I said metallurgy, process, technique, that's the mm -hmm. technique, that's mm -hmm. all on you. Pig welding, now I've up the degree of any, or uh, difficulty, because now what I'm doing, TIG torch, Typically, there's a handle here, a set of cables. This happens to be a water-cooled torch. Water is a coolant, just like in a water-cooled car versus an air-cooled car. So water in, water out, power, and then gas in. If you take this thing apart, you'll see the tungsten. You'll see the piece that holds the tungsten. All these things are sized to go together. create an electrical arc between the tungsten. In theory, that tungsten is a non-consumable. The reality of it is, especially when you're learning, you're dipping the tungsten in. <coughs> Excuse me. And you're learning how to tungsten grind more, more than you're learning how to weld. Very frustrating. Very frustrating. But once I get my puddle going, then I add my wire, and I start to make a weld. And I told you that MIG welding, then I add my wire, and I start to make a weld. And I told you that MIG welding was 20 inches a minute, mm -hmm. and laser was 60 inches a minute, that's three inches a minute. So the filler, does it actually touch that when you're... No, when... no, you kind of sneak it in low into the front edge of the puddle. And the reason why you're leaning the torch back, may I? Mm -hmm. As a welding engineer, if I'm welding my hand, I want my, por my torch straight up and down, and I want this nozzle as big as I can, size of a trash can. Why? Because then I get a bigger cloud, okay? You as a welder go, Jim, that's really cool. I can't see squat. I can't make the weld. I need to see what's going on. Yeah. Okay, let the compromises begin. We do a smaller nozzle, and then you lean it back, and your line of sight is this way. You're kind of looking down that way so you can see what's going on, and this is where you're adding your wire in because you've really got to see what's going on down here because it's giving you data feedback visually. It's telling you when to move forward, when to hold, when to add more wire, when to add less wire, maybe when to go back and do a repair job. All that's happening visually. Again, metallurgy, process, technique. Because I'm a bit slow, I want to ask. <laughs> so, Because I'm sure you're thinking this too. So you've got this rod, this filler rod, you're holding this somewhat vertical. You say there's a puddle, is there like actually a puddle exactly i've like I've a got, pool I'm, of something it's a pool of liquefied metal that i've, oh. I've made liquid by this electrical energy that i'm passing through it and Absolutely. are you keeping that puddle to a certain level by yeah. adding the filler in exactly. there exactly ah, okay exactly so I, I can't add my wire in too, too soon much. i can't add puddle's it too big it. it's all technique okay i see and oh yeah yeah yeah, and you got a foot pedal to control how much energy is coming out of there. So now I got a gas pedal, okay? No okay. brake, by the way. Just gas, gas okay. And then feeding exactly into the puddle. Okay. Exactly. This versus using one hand and a trigger. So why would you do this and not just use the other one? That seems like fun. <laughs> that doesn't sound like fun. That sounds like a lot of opportunities to make a mistake. For the same reason some of my buddies get into my 3RS and immediately turn off all the, so the controls because they want to show me how manly they are. No, ah. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they do do that. Um, but um, 
the reason you want this is it's slow, it's methodical, it's controlled. So let's think about making a roll bar or exhaust. Okay, I got a piece of, <coughs> man, I got something in here. Um, <coughs> Go ahead, me. take your time. So I've got a piece of two inch tubing. Let's see, circumference is pi diameter, so that's six inches. If I'm welding at 60 inches a minute, how much time do I have to rotate my hand around that? Whew, can't do it, yeah. can't do it. Okay, I'm doing MIG at 20 inches a minute, still can't do it, okay? TIG, the really cool thing about this is I can just keep the arc going, not put wire in, and just hang there forever. The, I'm just maintaining the puddle, okay? Then I maybe reposition my body as a welder, go back at it again, keep the arc lit, you know. So I've got complete control over the process. Just like those, those guys that say, hey, I want to turn off, I, I'm going to manually shift the PDK because I'm better than PDK. No, you're not, not really. <laughs> um, but they want that control. So this process gives you all that control. Gotcha. So it's, it's a really cool process. Um, can weld pretty much anything. Titanium, copper, aluminum, steel. Very versatile, okay? Can't weld plastic. But um, anyhow, so that's a TIG process. So let's, uh, g give me the next slide, because I gotta move on here. How to buy a welding machine. Uh, very personal choice. We all drive Porsches here. We bought it for a reason. We know that a Prius would get us to the grocery store this is reliable as my Turbo S, okay? Absolutely. Won't be as much fun, okay? And maybe we value the analog qualities that an air-cooled long hood has. So when you go buy a tool, it's the same decision process. Do I want a cabinet full of Snap-on or some other premier brand? Or do I go to Harbor Freight and buy the cheapest thing I want? I know I'm gonna break them, but that's okay. They're a third of the cost. I'll buy three or four of them. I'll lend them to my friends and never get them back because I don't care. It's crap. Uh, please excuse us if you like Harbor Freight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a major stockholder in Harbor. No, I'm not. Uh, but, you, but you get my point. You know, you, you, we all make a decision as to what we want to work with as human beings, okay? what our quality level is, what we're proud to have in our toolbox. So I'm not gonna talk about the cheap machines. I'm just gonna tell you that these top three brands are all US publicly traded companies, very large, have been around forever. ESOB's roots go back to uh, Sweden and they invented the stick welding process in 1901. Lincoln Electric, really an interesting company if you look at, at how they operate their business, but. Good, good, strong manufacturer, and Miller Electric, which is now owned by ITW. All three of them produce top quality stuff. And I think if you've been into any shop, the two middle ones are probably the predominant brands that you they see. They are definitely the dominant dogs yeah. in the US, okay? However, if you walk through a Toyota plant, a BMW plant, a GM plant, in this country, and especially in Europe, what you're gonna see is that last brand, Feronius. Hmm. And you go, never heard of them. Well, Feronius dominates the automotive automated segment, okay? So look for that brand when you see a video of how Porsche makes cars and the robots are zipping around. The arm itself may say ABB, it may say Motoman, but then look at the welding machine that's actually, they're dragging around, it's gonna be that one. Hmm. To the point of, all right, pop quiz, you should be able to get this, what does, Brands that Porsche use. Which brand? You walk into their plant, which one of those will you see? Peronius. 100%. Hmm. All 250 machines in their two plants are Peronius. 60% are automated, 40% are handheld. That's their brand of choice. Interesting enough, they are not publicly traded. They're a family owned third generation company based in Austria. Hmm. And when I first became aware of them, I saw what they were doing, I was impressed as a welding engineer, and then they hit me with this set of words that blew me away. They said, we don't make welding machines. 
we're a software producer that just happens to make things that make welds. And I started thinking about it. What I value as a welding engineer is the arc. It's kind of like you value that in the drive. That's why you drive a Porsche, not a Camry. You have figured out that drive just talks to your soul. It does what you want it to do. Feronius does that for welding, for me, personally. You know, just personal opinion. So, love the brand. Uh, you're going to see more of them in this country. They want to get more of the, of the U.S. handheld market. It's around. Um, but just interesting brand. So, my recommendation is buy one of the four brands. Now, if I'm looking at machines, how do I compare machines? Got two machines, all right? This is a Miller-Matic 300. This is a Lincoln 250. Well, clearly the Miller's bigger, isn't it? No, may not be because maybe they rate theirs on peak amperage, where Lincoln is representing theirs on 100% duty cycle. So first thing you look for is duty cycle. Duty cycle is based on a 10 minute time period. So if I say that this machine is 250 amps at 60% duty cycle, it means it'll give me 250 amps to work with for six minutes out of 10. I can't say, well, I'm just gonna weld for seven, then I'm gonna shut down for the next week. Nope, doesn't work that way. After six minutes, if it's a good machine, it's going to go into thermal overload. You've hit mm. your rev limiter. It's going to shut down. If it's a bad machine, the smoke will start escaping from the machine. And when these machines are smoke powered, once the smoke gets out, you can't get it back in, they don't work anymore. That's mm. just the way it is. So um, first look at duty cycle. Make your, make your decision on your process. Is it TIG? Is it MIG? I know you're a highly wealthy guy because you're president of, of PCA. So I know Once you're- Once again, we apologize for the false statements that may have been made during this broadcast. So I know you're already plotting to get two friction stir welders and at least a half a dozen lasers. But if you said, what do I buy first? The answer is make. You always start with make. Make, always start yeah, with you make. Can, you can buy a Lincoln, a Miller, and big machine for 700 bucks, okay? You get a brand that you can go back and get parts for for a long time. Um, it's gonna be there. Two grand will get you a multi-process machine. And once you figure out how to do MIG, and you're, you're like this, you go back and buy a TIG machine. You gotta think about welding as being tools in the toolbox. Yes, sir? I just reiterate, use a welding supply store, not, not a box store. I, I thank you for saying that, but. Uh, so the comment was use a welding supply store and not just a big yeah. box. Yeah. Oh. Well, okay, well, because <laughs> what, what, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're looking for is you're looking for expertise behind the counter. Hmm. You want to be able to say, you know, after you bought the machine three weeks later, hey, I got a problem with this, Vu. You sold me this machine, this is what it's doing. You want the guy to have some intelligence about, well, did you do this? Did you do that? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you'd like the guy behind the counter to say, you know, I can't figure out, bring it in, we'll weld with it together. Yeah, because you need their experience, right? Because exactly. you can order things online and get it to your door yeah. very conveniently. But yes. if you have an issue, especially something yeah. as complicated as welding, having that resource behind the counter to kind of walk you through it. Yeah. yeah. Um, ideally, you want to find somebody that will say, all right, you're going to buy a welding machine. I've got three here that I think would fit your, let's, let's power them all up and let's, let's weld. Now the trouble with that, you're buying your first machine, you can't spot the nuances. It's kind of like I can spot the difference between a $6 bottle of wine and a $20 bottle of wine, but you move from $20 to a $100 bottle of wine, I'm lost. I'm sorry, I just don't have that skill set developed yet on my palate. Welding's a bit like that. But still, you want that the guy behind the counter to have that expertise and be able to help you out. So the place I'd, I'd, I'd go to look is whoever you're gonna buy your gas bottle from. Because you're gonna have to buy a bottle of gas. So you're in that store anyhow. So see if he's got that intelligence to help you make that decision and power machines up and guide you through the process. And if you can establish a dialogue with him, oh man, it's gonna pay dividends. Gonna pay so dividends. when I see these welding machines, I see like a little rectangular cart and then they have cables coming out of it. Mm -hmm. Now this bottle is something that sits next to it. It is, it is. So most people will buy a bottle about this tall. Uh, it's an 80 cubic foot bottle. The gas is flowing, remember I was showing you a little cloud that flows out of the thing? Uh, that gas is flowing out about 20 cubic feet per hour. 80 cubic foot tank. You're pretty good with math in this crowd, I can tell already. So you get about four hours. You're, you were way ahead of me on that one, weren't you? So, but that's four hours of welding. That's a lot of arc on time. 
Uh, AWS says in production, the average welder only has the arc lit 27% of the time. So if I'm running a metal fabrication shop and I'm paying a guy for eight hours, guess what? I'm only getting like three hours worth of arc time out of that guy. The rest is setting the part up, chipping, slagging, moving around, that kind of stuff. So that's just an average. So really four hours is a lot of time. You own that bottle. The big bottles you don't own, you can. But typically, you don't, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So that little bottle you buy, maybe it's got my company name on it, it's got Vu's Welding Supply on it, doesn't matter. Um, Vu's Welding Supply, great welding supply shop in Columbia, Maryland. Goes, goes under the title of PCA, he's got this side business, no you don't. Uh, but um, you buy it, it says Vu's, you move to Naples, Florida. You take it down there and they go, we never heard of Vu's. Oh, really good guy up there, taught me everything you know. Well, they'll just take the bottle in and give you another one exchange. Okay, it's just one to one. So don't paint that bottle, don't plan on chrome plating it because you do have a rack full of snap on tools and everything's just perfect in your shop. Don't do that because when you bring the bottle back to those guys, you're never going to see it tanking. Again. So when you bring that bottle home or in your garage or your workshop, is there any special safety precautions to, yeah. um, to keep good, it in there? Good, good question. You need to have respect for all this stuff. Um, so let's talk about safety for a second. What's in that bottle is about 2,400 PSI. Ooh. Okay. All right. Well, car tires are 32. Truck tires are 90. 24. Ooh. So what happens if I drop that bottle and the valve shears off? <laughs> okay. Especially the big ones, they'll go through block walls. Ooh. Okay. So uh, you need to treat them with respect. Uh, the gas is non-flammable, so you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. But it is under high pressure. So there's a regulator that goes on it. All that stuff's geared for it. And when you buy the MIG machine, it's going to come with a regulator nowadays. Okay. You know, they, everything's kind of bundled together. So that's why they're always chained when I see them like in a shop. Absolutely. You yeah. don't want them falling over. Mm. I mean, you really don't. I, thought, I was thinking more on the flammable side, but now that no, the pressure no, it's, is it's, more it's the bigger no, concern. It's nothing but pressure. You know? oh. um, so uh, on the safety aspect, remember I told you AWS, American Walnut Society, sets the, safety, or sets the, the terms and definitions? They also set the safety standards. And you can download, if you go to aws.org, you can download for free, no money involved, uh, a document called Z49.1 Welding in, uh, Safety and Welding and Cutting. Download it. It's going to tell you about chaining it up and handling the bottles and, and what lens do I need to wear. And, and don't be the person on the, on the TV shows you see where they're, they're welding in short sleeves, okay? Mm -hmm. And just closing their eyes. Okay, um, you've only got two eyes. Don't, don't lose one to a welding spark or something. It's just a silly thing to do. And you know, the, 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 the spatter, those little BBs that, that blow off of welds, they feel like mosquito or, or bee stings. But still, I don't need more problems with my skin than I've got going on already. So wear a long sleeve cotton shirt at least. It doesn't need to be a full on leather you know, aluminized suit, just long sleeve Oxford shirt will do the job, okay? Or from the same guy you bought your machine from, they sell sleeves. So if you want to be working in your shop, your shop's not temperature controlled, got a t-shirt on, you can pull up a sleeve, kind of like what you used to see in the old westerns and the, 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 and the gambling, mm -hmm. you know? You slip that on, your arms are protected, you're good. So you mentioned about the, the eye protection. Yes. I've never mm -hmm. used one of those, but it's always a very dark glass. Mm -hmm. And how does that work and how can you see what you're doing? Okay. Um, when, when I learned how to weld many, many decades ago, that's all we had. So hood up, I can see what I'm doing, and a little nod of the head comes down, now I'm in complete darkness until I get the arc lit. Very frustrating when you're learning how to weld. Because when you did this, your hand moved out of the joint. Mm. You know, you're all set. You do this and you just shift your body. Now they have auto darkening helmets, so it makes it really easy. There are a shade three. Shade three is about the same density as a pair of normal sunglasses. As soon as it spots that arc, it, it darkens, darkens to a shade 11 or shade 10. Hey, dialed in. By the way, next, I don't know when the next solar eclipse is, you can use a welding helmet for looking at the sun. It's pretty cool, you mm -hmm. know? Because um, that's why I'm going to buy one. That's why you want to buy it. Exactly. Yes. Uh, we sold out of welding lenses in all our facilities the last solar eclipse because it was a big one. Huh. I mean, it was crazy how that happened. Um, 
So, yeah, buy yourself a nice helmet. Again, quality of tool. Can you buy one of these for, for 80 bucks? Yes. Will it protect your eyes? Yes. Will it fail on you in a year or two? You probably, okay? Or you buy a good self-darkening helmet, you'll probably have it for the rest of your life. Just a personal choice as to how you look at tools. So that's stick welding, by the way. Thank you for doing that. Um, and there's, there's a helmet, and you can see stick welding is a violent, hot process. So again, gauntlet the gloves. Splatter. You, know? you see a lot of splatter going on there. Right? Exactly, and, and it's just, yeah, not on my car. As I said, trailer okay. Um, so buy a make machine. I, 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 if it was my money, I'd buy one of those those big three. Um, if you feel furnace is going to cost you a couple bucks more, but as I said, there is a quality difference. You know, same as with cars. You know, we drive Porsches for a reason. You put a Ferronius MIG machine next to, um, can I say Harbor Freight again? Okay, I'm not picking on it. I already knew you were going to say it, so you uh, might as you well know say it. Anyhow, <laughs> just, just go to the internet, Google MIG machine, find the cheapest one you can, whatever brand that is, a, a Solar X or who cares, okay? Uh, and you put the two machines side by side and you go, well, this one's 200 amps at 60% duty cycle and that's 200. They're the same. Why am I going to pay four times more for the Ferronius than this? When you go to light the arc, you'll find out real fast. Mm -hmm. Because this one, the wire may do a lot of did, 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 and finally get going. Poof, poof, just smooth, calm arc right from the get-go. Again, because they've got the software down, right, yeah. to make that arc. So uh, let's move on, because we're going to run out of time. So um, metallurgy. Um, oh, boy, we are going to run out of time. Not, alloy, not all alloys are weldable, as I said. There's some aluminum alloys, like in the skin of an aircraft, not weldable. Good news is the stuff that goes into cars because the Porsche, Ferrari, Lamborghini, GM, they got to make the cars. So they're almost always weldable alloys. Um, most of the stuff that's in it is steel. Steel's easy to weld. Steel's a mixture of iron, silicon, manganese, and a little bit of carbon. Very little bit. Um, you may hear the term, this, this car has high strength alloys in it, high strength steel alloys. Mm -hmm. Don't weld. They get their strength from rain refinement and the heat from welding gets rid of that property. Mm. So you can weld them, you just need to be very knowledgeable about how to, how to pull that off. Uh, our Porsches have got lots of non-ferrous alloys, meaning they don't have, alloys don't have iron. Um, my, 90, my 73 has got a copper oil tank to it. I can weld that, I can also solder that, but it's copper, not steel. Um, there's aluminum in it. There's also magnesium, because some of the cases in the earlier calls are magnesium. Can you weld them? Sure you can. I've done this for friends numerous <laughs> times. Again, you go to the internet, oh, can't be welded, yeah, yeah, nonsense. You know, it's all about the metallurgy. So first thing you have to determine is what is the metal? It's, it's silvery, it's lightweight, could be aluminum, could be magnesium. They weld differently. How do I make the call? The right way to do it is you take a small piece about the size of my thumbnail, send it off to a metallurgical lab, 180 bucks later they come back and they tell you all the elements that are in it. Hmm. This much silicon, this much aluminum, this much you know, whatever's in it. Right. Then you give that information to a guy like me or you look it up in that book that's... Did somebody steal my book? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Okay. I will track you down. <laughs> so um, you, look that, you look it up in that book and they'll tell you how to weld it. Don't get hung up on it's a Porsche part or it's a fur. It doesn't matter. It's what's the alloy. So best way is to get the chemical analysis. You go, well, I don't want to go to all that trouble. How do I tell? Let's just make the cut between aluminum and magnesium. Aluminum is non-flammable. Magnesium is. So if I take a file and file, get a little gathering of filings of magnesium or this, I can't, I don't know what it is yet. Walk over to a, to a candle, sprinkle it in there. If it's magnesium, it's going to look like the 4th of July. It's mm. going to catch fire. It's just, you know, make, it's pretty cool stuff. If it's aluminum, it just kind of passes through. Great. Now I know it's magnesium or aluminum. Then I, I can make a high percentage guess. That book will tell me how to do it. If it's aluminum, probably 4043 is the filler metal I want to use because most aluminum alloys are aluminum and high silicon content. So that book would, would give you that guidance. If it's magnesium, it's an AZ61A alloy. Great, that's a percentage shot. And it's probably gonna work for you. So, it, welding's easy. You know what to do and how to do it. 
Um, so let's, let's, let's run through the next couple of slides and I'll wrap this thing up. Uh, okay. Ooh. Here we go. That doesn't look so good. Uh, this is not so good. Uh, this is on a, uh, a, a three liter 930 uh, turbo. And I knew that, that, that the fender had been repainted. So then I started to dig a little deeper. And there's on the passenger side a structural support. It's only on the passenger side. And I find these welds. They're not real pretty. Mm -mm. They're not factory welds. Okay? Uh, these welds up here in blue, these are spot welds. Okay? Now, these welds are not real pretty. Is that a safety concern? Nope. Structurally, it's, they're probably strong. Oh, absolutely. No. Absolutely. Um, we in the welding business, we cheat. We use filler metals that are stronger than the base material. And the old adage about a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Well, we put in this really strong link when we put a weld in. So it doesn't have to be all set. Could you hit the next one? Same car. Uh, another indicator that these are not factory welds. Um, you hmm. see this? Is that the fill-in? That, that, that's, that, that's actually a piece of wire that, yep. that kind of shot off. Remember I was talking about the quality of the arc and the machine that's used? Uh, the cheaper machines don't tend to light the arc off and they tend to blow pieces of wire at times. That's one of them. Mm. Um, this is a factory weld. Nice and smooth, you know? Nice aesthetics. One, one more slide on good, bad, all right? Um, see these whiskers? Again, mm. didn't light the arc off right. This, this is uh, the sway bar connection on a uh, long hood. Um, the guy was trying to make the weld down in here and the wire is shooting a long way down, so I have a very long piece of wire before it even hits and makes electrical contact, and the wire just goes poop and blows off that wire. Okay? Mm. Poor technique and poor machine. Mm. Uh, had he started here and then carried the puddle in there, probably wouldn't have happened. What was interesting to me is he tried three times before he gave up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's going on, I'll just keep doing it. Yeah. Um, so that's how you spot a weld. You know, factory welds, even back in the, in the really old Porsches, are high quality welds. Yeah. You don't find whiskers, which is you know, what those things are called. Um, so those are non-factory welds. Coming down to the end, OK. Um, tell you what, uh, let's wrap this up here. Is that there good? You go. OK, so hopefully you understand how to buy a machine. It's a personal decision. Um, what the first machine should be, MIG versus TIG. Once you get used to MIG and you're not so frustrated, learn TIG. Um, you've kind of learned how to make a good weld. It's metallurgy. Figure out what you're welding on first. Don't just, I got a machine, got a roll of wire, let's just see what happens. Let's try and do a little bit of engineering thought process as to what is this alloy. You know? It's easy enough to make the cut between steel and aluminum. A little more difficult between aluminum and magnesium, but hopefully I've, I've showed you how to do that. Um, if you say, well, actually, I'm not welding my car. I, I've got this piece of cast iron for lawn furniture. Can I weld that tree again? Different technique, because the difference between cast iron and the steel that's in car is just the carbon content. So again, that book would say, all right, this is what you do. You could use that same wire you use in your car, just preheat it with an oxidizing torch so it cools a little slower, so it doesn't crack. So um, you've learned how to identify the welds. Uh, but if you're still confused, this is how you get a hold of me. Uh, as I said, I, I don't tolerate people that, that don't do their homework. So if you got a problem, you, I'll make it a little snippy with you. If, if it's, I'm welding uh, my Porsche case. You know? well, what's the alloy? I don't know. You're supposed to, no, no, no. I know something about Porsches, but I'm not going there. So you got to do your homework. You got to say, OK, tell you what. This is a magnesium case because it is a late 68 versus a 67. You know, do your homework for me, okay? Uh, then I'll help you. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out and, and farm me a question. More than happy to, to back you up any way I can. Help you figure out that welding really is easy, because it is. I feel like this was my first day at school. <laughs> I've learned quite a bit. You're talking about homework. Um, I'm letting it all sink in because there was a lot of terms and I'm still trying to envision the puddle and feeding and how will I ever get to a point where I can weld something this beautiful. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Erlbeck, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us.
For those that are watching, please like, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have a goal of getting to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and each and every one of you can make a difference. Until next time, we'll see you. Nice job.